Okay, so you might have to bear with me today because as you might see, I'm not in the greatest of health. Um, I have a chronic condition, so it flares up and um, different things trigger it and I have no idea what's going to happen from day to day. Um, but it is something that can be managed and that we can um, use in our archaeology to um, make it more inclusive for people generally as well. So I'm going to talk about uh, the master's project that I did. So I was doing a um, historic building survey, uh, level two, from the Historic England guidance. And I discovered there's absolutely no information out there to make it accessible for someone who has a similar condition to me or some uh, people with physical conditions, um, um, sensory problems, so um, vision loss and hearing loss. Um, and we also covered uh, learning difficulties as well and other neurodiverse conditions. So this... So the aims of the project were to just try and create some kind of springboard so people um, had something to sort of work from in terms of uh, thinking about how you can make it accessible for people. Um, so as I said earlier, there wasn't any information specifically out there for someone who's interested in doing uh, buildings archaeology, but has um, conditions and other challenges. Um, there's great strides in archaeology, uh, becoming accessible excavations are a lot more accessible now. And um, hopefully this will sort of bridge a little gap in uh, buildings archaeology to give people an idea of how you can start to make it accessible. And also if you've got an interest in that area, how you might be able to um, break down the barriers that you thought were there. Um, because if you've got, I know if you've got a chronic condition like myself, quite often it's the perceived barriers that you're going to come up against that um, puts you off of doing things. Um, so we um, created the guidelines uh, based on a very kind of open, flexible and inclusive uh, approach. So I advertised for participants. So um, some of you who were here last year might remember that on the CFA stand there were um, invites to the dissertation. Um, I went to different um, disability charities, uh, different universities, um, the Enabled Archaeology um, Group and um, uh, CIFA buildings group and just any group that might be interested in either archaeology or making things more accessible or have an interest in buildings. So the first stage in that was um, when I was gathering oh, the participants, um, I did an interview with them um, over Zoom and what came out was they didn't really know a lot about disability. There were two groups um, that the participants sort of fall under. Those who have um, a condition which has an impact on them and therefore saw the benefit of the research and those that were interested in um, making their practices a bit more um, inclusive um, but they weren't really sure on how to do that or um, how different things affect different people. So out of that, we did a series of awareness recordings for each of the conditions that we were looking at. Um, these were done with people who either have the conditions or themselves or... Um, um, help people. So in the case of hearing loss, I had a um, BSL um, instructor who I was talking to uh, and how to make things more um, suitable for people who are hard of hearing, 
and also um, have no hearing at all. With um, vision impairment, I, we, um, I was in conversation with uh, a gentleman who's totally blind but runs his own um, awareness um, and training uh, company, um, teaching different assistive technologies for people who are blind. Um, and other um, people, like in this recording that you'll have a listen to in a little while, um, had physical conditions, but not necessarily physical conditions that you might have appreciated as might be an issue. So the lady that I spoke to was a really good friend of mine. She's in a wheelchair, but also she felt um, that it was important to also talk about the fact that um, she's incontinent and she needs to factor that in as well. So it's physical conditions can be things that you, you can't actually see, but it will impact on how, how people live their lives. Um, so we did focus groups. So these were meetings um, online through Zoom, uh, which were sort of drop in, focusing on different areas of the building's framework. So what I did initially was uh, split the framework down into the written record, the drawn record, and the photographic record that you need for the building survey. Um, and this was a challenge as well, because going on Historic England's website, downloading the PDF, the PDF isn't accessible. So what I had to do was turn it into an accessible format for people to be able to access. I did also email them um, and see if it was available in other formats. And basically they said, if I need it in other formats, it would cost. So not inclusive really at all. Um, and it's just small things that you can do uh, to kind of make it a lot more accessible for people. So even, even organisations that are doing fantastic things for accessibility are still sort of failing at some basic things as well, um, which this highlighted. Um, so in terms of the participants, so we had students, um, we had um, university lecturers as well, teaching archaeology. Um, we had uh, a few people from different archaeological organisations, so from um, organisations such as um, MOLA. Um, and also, what was quite interesting was we had a um, participant who was from Yale, University and he also saw the need for something. Um, so obviously this isn't just a, a UK problem, this is worldwide. So hopefully this will sort of, um, act as a bit of a springboard to try and um, encourage people to think um, differently. Um, now because it was quite intensive in terms of the uh, meetings, because they were an hour long each time, trying to get through the framework because it's quite extensive. Um, we did have people dropping in and out. We had quite a few dropouts for um, health reasons as well, um, and also um, different time constraints. So a few uh, students dropped out because of assignments and things like that. Um, so if I was to do that this in the future, I'd probably think about a different way of gathering the information. Oh. Is it? Oh. Hopefully it will play. Okay, that's not going to play, but it is um, available. Uh, it will be available on my website, so you can have a look. Um, I am also going to be doing 
um, different training sessions on this just to go a bit more in depth because it's it's quite um, it's quite common sense, but it's just a case of because there's a lot of the framework, you just have to go through it in a methodical way. So it, this is the guidance that we got from the participants, um, which again, I've got full copies of the um, actual thing with me. If you want, then you can take one away. Um, so for the written record, um, what I've done here is I've generalised all the points for all the conditions, whereas in the actual guidance, it's split up into the different areas. Um, so for argument's sake, if you are an archaeology unit or you are doing a building survey and you have someone with autism or other a neurodiverse condition, you can look in that specific section as to what things they might need. But also very important to remember that... The guidance is just a starting point. The main thing is to talk to the people that you're working with because they will know most of the time what they need. So in terms of the written um, record section of the framework, um, these are the key things that came out. So organisation of notes and references in a way that's um, more practical for you. So if you are visually impaired, you're not necessarily going to be want to be writing everything down. So you might record it instead. Um, also, um, if you've got um, ADHD um, or autism, it might be quite good to have um, everything in a logical order that makes sense to you rather than following someone else's um, lines also you need to set realistic time scales so you do need to factor in um rest breaks um any um time for any training that's needed in a way that's applicable to the people that um are doing the survey um a checklist of what's actually needed for the survey is quite good so you can break that down so you need um, sort of like the background history um, you'd need if there's any um, visible changes and things like that and um, so like if you're doing mine was on a market hall so you might say okay so I need you to um, um, look through the uh, documents to see if there's any changes to these particular walls or anything like that. Um, you also need a very clear brief. Um, it's really important, especially if you've got um, ADHD and autism, to have a clear brief and know what's expected of you. Um, it really helps you to sort of focus, um, but it also and it also prevents the um, sort of getting too bogged down into a, into a certain element of it. Um, so this is where the standard historic building survey template comes in. So you can, as an organisation, have a standard template that you follow um, steps which you do the survey in so that you can make it um, uh, more accessible. So you also, as Sarah Jane mentioned earlier, um, people um, with different conditions can also think slightly differently. So the, you might be able to introduce improvements and um, reduce um, timeframes of certain tasks. Um, so also you need the timeout uh, breaks with spe specific room as well. So um, people know that they can go in there and won't be bothered. They can just calm down at their own rate. Um, you also need to identify potential triggers. So this is important for argument's sake if you're, um, the obvious one is if you have a colleague with PTSD or other mental health issues and they are being asked to um, um, look at a building that was a military building. If they were in the um, military, that could bring back certain things um, the same with if for argument's sake if you have a mental health issue um, if you're looking at old asylum and 
um, prison buildings that can be quite traumatic so um, you need to consider that and also colleague support it is really important to have open honest conversations so that your colleagues can actually support you um, and it also encourages a better cohesive working unit as well so um, again you'd need prompts um, to protect against procrastination so if you're getting too hyper focused on a specific thing then you need to um, be able to feel confident as a colleague to say okay that's done as far as we need it to be done we've got this list of things that needs to be done perhaps you can go back to that if you've got a bit more time um, so you need to identify any travelling barriers, especially with physical conditions. Um, you can also do um, site visits um, via Zoom and FaceTime now. Um, and you can also um, have a colleague go out and take photographs so you can get a, an idea and be able to support um, the survey that way. There's also um, specialised equipment, so you can have the ramps, um, as they did in the whole project, um, and the other assistive technologies. Now, the main thing is changing documents to accessible formats. That is really key, um, and that is really hard because we have huge archives of really inaccessible material <laughs> so um but is it inaccessible because there are ways even if you are totally blind you can um, scan a page with an app and it will read it out to you um, so there are ways around it um but I, I don't know if you've noticed but at each of these um endings I've put a full stop so that helps someone who's visually impaired and using a screen reader because they know it's going on to a new topic um, so you also need to think about the environment is it too noisy um, do you um, like for argument's sake if you're um, looking through online um, archives and the office is a bit noisy, you might want to put on some headphones, maybe even if it's just white noise, if that's something that, that suits. Um, also, um, one thing that is really sort of underestimated with someone with sensory loss, especially um, if you've got um, visual impairment, is quite often other senses um, sort of fill the gaps in in the processing in the brain so there might be different soundscapes in different buildings that might um, help you understand the um, the use of the buildings at that time um, proofreading is also essential as well and again communication very very important um, Proofreading, um, if um, we've got some uh, online training, which I'll bring up later, but if you wanted one of my leaflets, I should have taken my own advice on that because there's a, a mistake on the last line. So, yeah, very important, especially when you've got brain fog and you're like, oh, trying to do things in a rush. But it's very, um, very good to kind of be a bit more mindful of what's needed. Um, so in the photographic record, so you need a clear strategy of what photographs you need, um, a checklist, um, running order will be quite good so that um, all the photographs are in order, especially if you're um, um, visually impaired then and you're, or you um, struggle with writing, so you've got dyslexia or something like that and you're creating audio notes, you can then um, make a note of what photograph is before you talk about it and it um, um, makes sense when you go back to look at it. Um, video walkthrough, again, is very good to just... Um, uh, so you can have a, an initial look at the building, uh, especially if you've got um, physical 
um, conditions. But also, if the video walkthrough is high enough resolution, you can take stills from that as well. Um, so again, colleague support and regular breaks, a rest space, um, realistic timeline. Um, so you also need to make sure that um, there is sufficient accessible training on the equipment. So obviously different cameras perform in different ways. Um, if, for argument's sake, you are using the strategy of uh, lining the photograph up on the tripod and taking um, a, a photo with the remote, you could do that if you're visually impaired. There are also apps which tell you what's in in the um, view of your of your um, device as well. So that's um, quite an easy thing to um, sort out, but you just need to be a bit more mindful that it might take a little bit more time. Um, also division of labor. So if you are unable to take the photographs, you might be able to do the um, background um, reading for it or, or the um, measurements or drawings. So um, it's not necessarily um, a boom or bust situation. You can, you can utilize colleagues' support, especially if you've got that really good communication. And also it's quite good to have more than one person on the site with you anyway for health and safety reasons. So why not make that more um, inclusive? Um, also, you mark hazards with contrast tape, um, especially when moving around the building. So um, the, if it's in a dark space, the edges of stairs um, can be um, just taped with a fluorescent tape so that you can see it better. Um, if someone's totally blind, you can also have a sighted guider um, to guide guide you around. That doesn't have to be an extra person. That can also be provided by um, things such as access to work as well. Um, so where things aren't accessible as well, you need to report it in the um, in the report because safety is a priority, especially if you've got um, conditions. And you might want to think about other ways of doing things. So if you can't get up high to a different level, then you could use a drone or um, things like that and use different um, color for, uh, photo photography scales if you've got um, conditions like color blindness or anything like that. And then you could doctor out editing. Um, so now going on to the drawn record. So again, see a lot of these are um, very similar things. Um, in terms of the drawn record, um, looking more along the lines of measuring things and being able to do that um, appropriately. So um, you can use laser measures, um, which will um, tell you what the measurement is. So that's something that you can do. Um, you can also um, you do basic sketch maps in order to help you do the measurements and then uh, put it through something like a swell printer, which um, basically the ink puffs up. So it creates a raised map. And you can, as long as you orient, are able to orientate the person with um, limited sight as to where you are, they can write on the drawings and things, the measurements. Um, so you've also got things like um, portable seats, things like that. Um, in all of this, um, you need to consider health and safety. So if you've got someone with um, hearing loss or someone who um, has no hearing at all, you can use vibrating and flashing alarms um, um, and just be mindful of the safety. So basically, these are the common themes. I'm not going to um, read them out again because I think you've had them throughout the whole presentation. Um, so what's next for us is we're doing um, training sessions 
Um, so we're doing more in-depth around the uh, building survey, so we're um, look at it in, in a greater detail and you can apply it to different case studies, not just the one that I've done, which is available to download off my website as well. Um, so uh, we're doing vision loss awareness training as well. Um, so these are all online. Um, and also meaningful inclusion, so looking at different ac um, accessibility needs. So looking more into um, document accessibility, website accessibility, um, looking at um, just how to make things a lot more inclusive. So I do have uh, leaflets down here for the training as well and the um, full guidance. So. Um, I think that's it. So um, I think we're having questions at the end, but that's my information and it's on the leaflets or I've got a card. So thank you very much for listening.